former home of Nobel Prize winning author William Faulkner attracts thousands of visitors from all over the world every year. In fact, Roanoke is probably one of Mississippi's most recognizable historic landmarks. So it's no wonder that one of the country's most prolific historical filmmakers, Ken Burns, would request a visit during a recent trip to Oxford. While here, he sat down for a conversation with his good friend, the acclaimed classical pianist from Mississippi, and now artist in residence at Ole Miss, Bruce Levingston. Well, good afternoon, Ken. I'm so glad that you've been able to come here to the University of Mississippi and to Oxford. And here we are in William Faulkner's home now. Very, very impressive moment. You know, I think that all of my professional life, I've strained to hear the ghosts and echoes of an almost inexpressibly wise past. Mm -hmm. And here we are in the parlor of the man who reminded us that the past is not past at all, that, that history is not was, but is. And that has certainly been my lifelong work, is to try to uh, awaken those seemingly past moments and remind us of their relevancy to today. Yes. Yeah, as I hear you say that, I'm thinking, uh, at, at what point do you believe we're able to look back and evaluate history? How removed must we be from an event in order to understand its role in the larger historical framework? Well, I, I think that what we try to do in history is what in astronomy they call triangulation. You need to get far enough away in order to understand something. Uh, I'm working on a film about the Vietnam War. If we'd done it in 1985, uh, it would be this ball and chain that would forever be dragged behind us because we were in a recession, Japan was ascendant, we talk about the decline of yes. the United States. You wait 20 years and we're just after the first Gulf War in the largest peacetime expansion. That's a different sort of thing. Of 30 years later, you're after 9-11 and, and with Iraq and Afghanistan, so suddenly Vietnam takes on a new and different thing. And so I think what the passage of time permits us is perspective, yes. that ability to understand what the passions of the moment were uh, without necessarily falling prey to those passions. Of course. Well, we are in an area where uh, passions still run high about uh, a war that was very long ago but is very much with us, uh, the Civil War. Your great documentary, The Civil War, first aired on public television 25 years ago this year and seemed to seize the nation's imagination. Did its reception surprise you? And, and if you were thinking about making it today, would you do something different? Would you? I think if I made it today, it would be different only because I'm different. The centrality of the Civil War has never changed. Yes. Uh, everything from the moment we were created uh, when we know, unlike most countries, exactly when we were created, in Philadelphia on July 4th, 1776. And we look to, as our catechism, our founding statement, the second sentence uh, in the English language. I think it's the second greatest sentence in the English language after I love you. We hold these truths to be self-evident. But I have to stop halfway through that sentence to tell you that the man who wrote that sentence owned more than 100 human beings. Yes never saw the contradiction, never saw the hypocrisy, and more important, never saw fit in his lifetime to free any of those individuals and set in motion an American narrative that would fourscore and five years later bring us to a civil war that massacred more of our own citizens than all other American wars combined killed. And so that everything that came before the Civil War, led up to it, and everything since, I believe, is a consequence. And the passion and the fervor with which we debate and think and talk mm -hmm. about it um, makes it centrality for, the, for as long as there are Americans. And so, in some ways, I was flabbergasted as a, as a young filmmaker that my sixth or seventh film, whatever it was, would take off the way it did. But in retrospect, I'm not su surprised that the Civil War would have that kind of a staying power. It is the most important event in American history, full you talk, stop. You talk about duration having such an effect, and in 11 and a half hours when mm -hmm. you first started, people <laughs> must have thought, no one's going to watch this. They said, still pictures, nobody's, and originally, the original conception, Bruce, was to do it as five one hours each year of the war, you know, of course. And, and, and what happened is we ended up after a very long first episode to divide each year, 62 through 65, into two separate uh, episodes. And so that's nine. 
and all of a sudden those five hours are 11 and a half, and the people who at five hours are saying, I don't think anyone's gonna look at still photographs uh, for five hours. Maybe they would for your earlier films, an hour, an hour and a half, the Brooklyn Bridge, Huey, Huey Long. But they not only did, but they continued to watch. Sure. In an age when we're supposed to be so uh, distracted, and back then they said nobody will watch this, uh, it's an MTV mm. generation, now it's YouTube sen sensibility. It's not true. All meaning accrues in duration. Yeah. We are starved for curation. We are starved for the kind of things that uh, bring us that meaning, and that meaning can only accrue over time. Yes, I believe that I read that the Roosevelt's had more viewers than Downton Abbey. It, 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 I, I don't know about that, but I know that nearly 35 million people watched, mm -hmm. some or all of it, just the very first time it was broadcast. And, and that means, and I know that Downton and the Roosevelt's has helped lift uh, PBS from being the 11th ranked network to being the fifth after the big three and Fox. That's an extraordinary record when all other networks, ex I think except for one, and it's a minor one, are contracting a little bit in the face of the internet, in the face of all the other distractions that we have. It just means that this idea of commercialist, public broadcasting service Yes. Works and is required and is needed. And I'm happy to be part of that family. I, I want to come back to the Civil War. There's an interesting moment uh, in the documentary where Shelby Foote memorably says that during the war, quote, we, we lost the thing that made uh, us great, yes. uh, that, that helped us survive. It was the ability to compromise. And in light of the times we're in now and given what we see in American politics, what does that mean for our country? Well, Shelby hit it the nail right on the head. Yeah. The reason why we murdered 750,000 of our own is because we reached uh, a gridlock well beyond what we complain about today. Uh, we reached a point where compromise, which is the genius of America. Shelby yeah. said, we like to think of ourselves as uncompromising people, but our genius is compromise, and when we quit compromising, uh, look what happened. We started murdering each other. We cannot get to that point again. We have to say that the past is the greatest teacher we have. Mm -hmm. History is the greatest teacher we have, and we have to begin to understand. For those people today that find compromise a dirty word, that, 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 that in fact take uh, leaders and, and throw them away just because they broke bread with the enemy. And what's the enemy? Other Americans who care about Us. exactly the same Agents. thing yes. and want the same thing for their kids. They just want to approach it in a different way. That's always been the American ideal. These people actually don't know our history and they haven't read their constitution. And, and part of that is that George Will, the conservative columnist, said to me that politics is the politics of the half loaf. You never get everything you want. And I'm afraid that we've got a whole bunch of people around that suddenly believe that compromise is a dirty word and we only forget that genius of ours at our peril. What do you feel that we can do about this historical amnesia, the sense that somehow uh, that we are forgetting Past. Well, well, I think what we tend to do, and it's unfortunate, is we tend to make partisan attacks. We tend to then use history as a cudgel to beat up people. And we, we can't do that. What we need is to tell an honest, balanced history that reminds people of the glories. You know, it's so funny that in the last few decades, the idea that the United States government has become a force of evil in the world mm. is, is startling to me because, in fact, you know, perhaps along with the Christian Church, I don't know of a greater force for good that has the Declaration, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Homestead Act, the Land Grant College Act, the Transcontinental Railroad, the National Parks, child labor, social security, the interstate highway system, man on the moon. I've given a tiny, tiny list of the things it's done well and somehow we've gotten a little bit off kilter and we now see it as the enemy. Instead of seeing that, that we want less government or more government, it's not that. Everybody really wants, if they examine in their hearts, they want good government. That's and right. I think we can t use history not to lecture, not to oppose, but to be a reconciling faster. Mm -hmm. If we've got this dialectic, and we're in this binary thing right now, red state, blue state, right. male, female, rich, poor, north, south, east, west, gay, straight, all of this stuff, we want to divide on that. Where might we find what Abraham Lincoln said were the better angels of our nature? Exactly. I believe we find that in the study of history. So one of the things that seems to come through in your films, what, whether it's the Civil War or baseball or jazz or the Roosevelt's or even the National Parks, there's some, 
is, is, you find the common humanity in all of us. And yet you have uh, talked about that in every film, race is a central issue. And I'm particularly uh, interested because the day you arrived in Oxford, uh, one of the most hotly debated symbols, uh, the old Confederate flag, which uh, exists inside the Mississippi State flag, uh, was taken down from the University of Mississippi. Uh, quite a big moment here. Huge moment, and huge moment. So what do you feel in light of your lifelong efforts to enlighten people on race and on well, issues like this. The fact is, is that when you want to do a deep dive in American history, you're going to come up against our monumental hypocrisy. That hypocrisy in which we proclaim to the world, not just to ourselves, mm -hmm. to the world, that all men are created equal, but oh yeah, we're going to tolerate that four million Americans are owned by other Americans in 1861. What did John J. Chapman say? That? John J. Chapman was, a, was an essayist and he said there was never a moment uh, during uh, when slavery was uh, not a sleeping serpent. They're during the, the, the during the deliberations of the Constitutional Convention, it lay coiled under the table. It, it, slavery, if not always on one's tongue, was always on one's mind. So it's always been there. Jefferson himself said uh, he, he didn't like it. It was like holding a wolf by the ears. He didn't like it, but you didn't dare let it go. And so we spent a long time, decades, temporizing, trying to compromise it away, or, or worse, in Dred Scott and other things, yes. uh, strengthening the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, really uh, sort of accelerated the rush towards that cataclysm that is their, our civil war. But so race appears everywhere uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. It is the inability for people to say, we all say, oh, we're, I'm Americans, I agree, all men are created equal. But in f point of fact, we are unable, as Dr. King asked us, to see people based on the content of their character rather than on the color of their skin. And so this is something that we struggle with. And so it appears when you don't, expected a history of baseball. What's its most important moment? When Jack Roosevelt Robinson, the grandson of a slave, makes his way to first base at Ebbets Field on April 15, 1947. Oh, by the way, that's the first real progress in civil rights since the Civil War. What? It's, it's decades and decades yes. after the Civil War. This is before the integration of the military, it was. It's before Brown versus Board of Education, before lunch counter sit-ins, right. before Rosa Parks b refused to give up her bu bus seat. Oh, and by the way, 11 years before Rosa, B Rosa Parks, Jackie Robinson had refused to give up his seat when ordered on a military camp in Texas. So we have this sense of recurring things, patterns in American history, and one of the patterns that we are both ennobled and, and bedeviled by is a question of race. Why ennobled? The only art form that Americans have created that's recognized around the world, jazz music, right. along with the blues, is born in a community that has the peculiar experience of being unfree in a free land. That's stop the presses. The genius of America is improvisation. Of course. That's what we do. Our, 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 our Constitution is four pieces of parchment written in the late 18th century that's able to adjudicate the most thorny questions in this, the new 21st century. But underneath that all was the fact that we tolerated chattel slavery, which made the African American community have to improvise a lot more than the rest of us. How, how do we live with this past? There are symbols that exist, we've talked about this, that there are, are statues that uh, we feel some we can live with that are uh, in a sense, uh, more reverential than uh, symbols of pride of the South, but others that we're uncomfortable with, uh, such as the Confederate flag. Uh, what is your feeling about this? And the Dixie flag, the Confederate flag, only gained enormous popularity in two periods. One in the late 80s and early 1890s, mm -hmm. uh, when Reconstruction had collapsed and there was a new law, Jim Crow, that was the law of the land. The Ku Klux Klan was ascendant. Uh, the choice of justice for African Americans was called lynching. And one battle flag, one battle flag, not the official flag of the Confederacy, which is the stars and bars, but one battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia became the symbol of that. It worked its way into the Mississippi's flag, uh, the Bonnie Boo flag, which is a beautiful flag, right. disappeared. And then 
That was it until 1954, when most of the other states of the Confederacy uh, added that Confederate flag, only one battle flag, not the official flag of the Confederacy, yes. into their flags. And the only thing that happened in, in, in 1954 a, in a year. was when Brown versus Board of Education happened. So in a way, it was saying, no, we do not believe that all men are created equal. We're opposed to this. And what happened is, is that there's been a lot of obfuscation that's been going on, that this is our symbol, you're taking away our heritage. That's not a heritage. The, the, we, need, we need to preserve a heritage, but let's also understand that the Confederacy was there to promote slavery. It, it wasn't about states' rights. It wasn't about nullification. It wasn't about all the other things that have been built around it. That's important to really understand. There is nothing in South Carolina, the first state to secede, articles of secession that mention states' rights or nullification. These are things that have been added in the decades since to justify. If you are for that, you are for the perpetuation of slavery. So as we examine our monuments, we have to examine the way in which sometimes we build these monuments obscuring to ourselves as well as to future generations what the actual symbol means. And then we need to, on a case-by-case -case decision, decide, you know what, maybe that belongs in the museum, or that belongs over there, or we need to add some interpretive material. And why aren't we also celebrating the heroes of World War I, the heroes of World War II, with the equal sort of force? And, and that's something that I think not just Mississippi, but a good deal of the United States has to, has to look and see. What, what do we preserve when we keep the Confederacy alive, mm -hmm. and particularly now when we have so many citizens who, for whom that flag is, is extraordinarily hurtful, yes. in which that is a symbol of resistance. It's a, it, that flag is saying to people, you are not mm -hmm. equal to me. You are not a human being. You are not what Thomas Jefferson meant when he said all men were created equal. When he wrote that sentence, which is a beautiful sentence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. He meant all white men of property, free of debt. Yes. Okay? So yes. he didn't mean women. He didn't mean all the other who had been extended to him. He certainly didn't mean the African-American slaves in his, in his, uh, in, on his plantation. Right. But, but he also wrote at the end of the sentence, he could have followed Locke and said life, liberty, and property. But he said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we think happiness is the pursuit of material things in a, in a marketplace of objects, when in fact, happiness to the founders, capital H happiness, meant lifelong learning in a marketplace of ideas. And that the most important word is not happiness, but pursuit. We are in That's pursuit right. of happiness, which means we're making it better. So all men are created equal now means a lot more than it did uh, the, in Thomas Jefferson days, and that's what keeps the United States vital. That's what makes us exceptional. And what we need to do is escape the specific gravity of those past tropes and misunderstandings and false histories, and not throw away our complicated and tragic and glorious past, but to figure out a way how to bring everyone into it. Let us remember, let me not let focus on Mississippi. Let us remember that there were 30 million, 31 million Americans in 1861 as the war began. Um, 21 million of them lived in the North. 9 million lived in the South. 4 million of them, 45% of the population slaves. were slaves. Yeah. So when we begin to say they, meaning all African Americans, we make a mistake, or the South, we make a mistake too. 45% is a huge percentage of the population. Now, if you believe that African Americans are subhuman, then I don't have a conversation I can have with you. Right. But if you believe in what the United States believes in, then we need to fly uh, old glory above our courthouse. Yes. You are about to uh, release a film about Jackie Robinson, whose life was extraordinary. And I, I can't help think that his life has resonance for what we're talking about. It's so funny. Almost every time you pick up a moment in the past, it resonates with the present. You know, like historians are fond of saying there's cycles to history. Mm. I don't believe that. Uh, so we, are all, we all love to quote George Santayana's quote, or the quote that's attributed to yeah. him that says, we're condemned to repeat what we don't remember. Mm. It's lovely, but I don't think it works. I like Ecclesiastes. 
What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new under the sun. What that says is that human nature remains the same. That that human nature superimposes itself over the seemingly random chaos of events and that we can begin to perceive with that perspective patterns. Sure. Things happen over and over again. So Jackie Robinson's story was this one of the central stories in our big baseball series, but he was so important a figure he deserved standalone treatment. And he wasn't just a black baseball player. He was a black man who spent every moment of his adult life trying to make the lives of others better. He knew by going through this one particular door, I mean, if this is, it's symbolically huge to integrate the national pastime. Of course. But then he did, he understood that in, until you got that second person in and that third person in, and then you integrated the American League and then you integrated all the teams. And then you said, well, what's going on? He then, after baseball, sort of plows himself into the civil rights movement. This is a little known story that's complicated. He was a Republican for much of his life and he was supporting and campaigned for Richard Nixon. I don't think he voted for him. At the end, he went and campaigned for Governor Rockefeller. I mean, mm. this was this was not, this is an interesting life story that has on its cusp the sense of what can you do for others. And that's how he lived his life, the dignity with which he lived his life and also executed the game. Which, well, if you think about this, this is somebody, I think it was George Will again, who told me that the amount of equipoise needed to hit a, a baseball with yeah. a bat is so extraordinary. We know that the greatest basketball player in the universe, Michael Jordan, when he quit for a few years to try baseball, couldn't hit a buck 85. Right. Um, but Jackie Robinson, in the midst, with people threatening to kill him, um, played well. With That's people right. putting black cats on the field, played well, with right. with threats against his wife and his little baby played well, with thousands of hate mail played well, with the other teams bent jockeying, with his own teammates not sure of how to do it, still segregated, to, you know, having to have his locker in another place of, of the clubhouse, of having to take showers apart, mm -hmm. still played well. And we have to begin to understand that this is one of the most extraordinary lives and never ever, um, resorted to violence. Never saw that as an option in the push towards equality and and the absent and, and opportunity, which must be at the heart of all true Americans, the objective. Well, that's it. Uh, I can't help but think that his life uh, still will resonate with Americans today uh, as we see uh, not only African Americans, but uh, many people who feel somehow disenfranchised and uh, not as welcome in the American family as, as they try to lead their lives with dignity and uh, go forward and uh, make uh, this country a place that uh, all people will feel welcome in. That's exactly right. He's sort of a living, breathing, human Statue of Liberty. It's, it's, it's filled with symbolic purport, but at the same time is flesh and blood. So we recognize in him aspects of ourselves. And I think it inspires me. He's certainly not, he didn't just help usher in some of the greatest players. I mean, his moment is the most important moment in baseball. Sure. He's not the greatest player. The greatest player, right. one would argue, are many of the people who came in after him, those African-American players, the Latin players, in addition to the others, who benefited from a game that you could really say was the national cool. pastime. I mean, if before he came up, you couldn't say this was the best team ever because they weren't playing against Satchel Paige or Buck O'Neill or, you know, Josh Gibson. That's, that's right. um, and now you could. I, I want to say, I, I think, too, that you yourself have played that kind of role in opening our eyes in uh, the face of uh, sometimes great obstacles uh, against what maybe uh, the media at the time when you were starting uh, felt would work. Uh, so, you know, history is a complicated business and I think for our own media culture where everything is conventional wisdom, where everything is relatively superficial, um, we tend to gravitate towards the easy explanation. Well, American history is just a series of presidential administrations punctuated by wars. No, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. And let me tell you a few stories in that. And what I find is, is that you know, a lot of people say, well, you're just tearing things down. 
you know, why are you doing it about this? And why do you focus on this? I said, it's not a choice. It's that if you do a deep dive into any subject, you are going to come up with these things. And it just doesn't help to sanitize it with a kind of Madison Avenue icing on it that makes everything feel good. In fact, I find that that, that resurrecting a complicated history actually makes you feel much better because the good feeling isn't the sugar rush of that, of that icing. It's something that's much more nutritious and tastes actually better in the end. And that's what you want to have. You want to have a serviceable history. How do we take our history and go forward from this moment? Well, you have to take an accurate history. And if that requires lifting up the, 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 the rug and sweeping yeah. out some of the dirt, that's not in any way diminishing the beauty of that tapestry. It is, in fact, perhaps highlighting it. But if you're going to say this is the greatest country on earth, mm. if you're going to say that we can have exceptionalism, then you better know your history because you've got to know that that exceptionalism also stands in contrast, stark contrast to times when we didn't do that. Right. And just like the football coach on Friday night or Saturday afternoon says, you know, we stunk today. We didn't do this very well. We have to apply a kind of honesty to ourselves so that when we get out of the football game of life, yes. we're not saying, oh, that was a really, that was perfect. Well, you lost 58, and yeah, but you don't know the way in which we. No, we stunk today, and let's do better next Saturday. Ken, thank you for helping us uh, see our way and for sharing your vision with us and for being here. Wonderful to thank have you here. Thank you. It's my you. pleasure. Our thanks to both Ken Burns and Bruce Levingston. We'll see you next time on Conversations. And remember, you can go to MPB's website for additional content on this program.